All right, well, I think we'll kick it off. Um, I just wanna welcome everybody to the session and those who will be listening to the recording. My name is Joanne Sunshine, and I'm founder and CEO of Connective Impact. And I'm really happy to be joined by a remarkable panel today. And I will be turning it over to these three amazing women momentarily to introduce themselves. But in the meantime, I do wanna set the stage for this discussion today. Uh, Connective Impact is a membership organization that works with international NGOs, corporations, and funders to help build collaborations around resource development and funding to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the things that we are hearing quite often from our members is how this effort to focus on community-led development is resonating in their work and what it means for their resource development efforts and fundraising strategies. And it's causing us to, to take a lot of time and reflection to understand the movement towards local partnership development and creation and how communities can take ownership um, of the needs and opportunities that they see in front of them. There's a movement called Shift the Power in, in development that um, some of our panelists have been involved in and this idea about flexible funding and engagement with partners at a, at a more communal um, level that, that has really resonated with me personally and with our members. And it's, it's that notion that led us to develop the, the topic for today's discussion, which is about how local uh, diversified partnerships can help advance global development. And my panelists today are going to be talking um, from kind of the three cornerstones of, of our membership base, which is, again, funders, corporates, and NGOs, and speak to this idea about how local partnerships uh, resonate in their work and why in involving partnerships generally and also at, at a community level is so critical to their missions. And so I'm going to kick it off by asking the panelists today to introduce themselves and their organization. And uh, to, to start off, I'm going to ask each of them in their introductions to share with our audience how they define partnerships and per, uh, particularly local partnerships in their work. And I will say that as we go, I'll be facilitating some Q&A myself but I would ask you to please uh, put any questions you have in the Q&A box and we'll make sure we get to as many questions as we can. So I'm going to start by um, asking Lisa Jackson, please introduce yourself and your organization and share how you define local partnerships in your work. Great. Thank you, Joanne, and thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with my colleagues. Um, so my name is Lisa Jackson. I am the managing partner for a family foundation Boston, uh, based in Boston, Massachusetts in the US uh, called the Imago Day Fund. We've been around going on 12 years now and our work um, is primarily grant making. And we do that grant making here in the US in our neighborhood in Boston, but also um, in the larger world, in East and South Africa, Southeast Asia, parts of the Dominican Republic, and Haiti. And, um, you know, the, the definition of local partnership uh, for us really is about how do we support through our funding and our other resources, local leaders who are creating change where they are, in the communities they are in, um, and defining the change that needs to happen. And when we're doing that, we're looking very carefully at not just whether there is local leadership, but who locally is making decisions about money and resources, um, and you know how are those things being sustained within the community? And so when we go to look for partners to fund, um, that is definitely a primary characteristic for us that we're interested in um, and interested in growing in our portfolio work. Great, right, Lisa, thank you for being here. And I'll see, next on my screen is uh, Martina. So Martina, if you could introduce yourself and, and answer the same question. Thanks, Joanne. And um, yes, thanks to, to for in the invitation to, to join the panel today. It's my second all-female panel of the day. Uh, I joined a different event earlier this afternoon on a very similar theme of collaboration and partnership. So it's, uh, it's great to be here for this one. Um, uh, I lead our regenerative agriculture strategic work uh, within our global procurement function at Diageo. 
Um, so in itself is sort of the, the opposite end of, of the spectrum in terms of local partnerships. Um, but in building out that strategic work, we obviously have to look at, at really the critical pathway to implementation. And that's where our local markets and, and sort of semi-autonomous businesses um, who are tasked with deploying the great strategies we come up with are really, really critical to engaging uh, the right partners at, at uh, the ground level. And from an agriculture perspective, that starts right with our farmers. Um, it, it, it ladders up to the cooperatives, the brokers and the aggregators, but it's also the, off, the other off takers and the extension service providers. And, um, you know, that's just on, on an agriculture perspective. I think as we look to um, deploy and achieve our 2030 ambition, which we, we launched last November, um, the Azure 2030 spirit of progress. It is really looking at how do we um, enable and build those partnerships at scale globally to really um, drive with the pace that we need. Uh, and, and therefore, I don't think we've got a very singular definition of partner. I think um, that actually we've got quite a broad sense because they will have to come in all shapes and sizes. They, we will have to think quite laterally about what a partnership looks like uh, in terms of the, the, the different parties that might come into that. And uh, I think the interesting space around um, pre-competitive uh, partnerships is, is something that we're very much embracing um, to be able to, to achieve the scope of the ambition and clearly the, the scope of, of the task that's ahead in terms of the SDGs. Great. Thanks, Martina. And obviously, Nabiha, you come at partnerships from an entirely different angle. So if you could share from PAI's perspective how, how you work with local partners, how do you define effective partnerships? Well, thank you, Joanne, for, for convening us. Um, I am uh, Nabiha Kazi, the president and CEO of PAI, and we're a leading nonprofit organization. We're based in Washington, D.C., and um, we uh, were founded 56 years ago when we're part of a global movement uh, that is really focused on advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights for communities around the world, um, knowing that these services are fundamental to health and well being, to autonomy, everything ranging from access to contraception to the to the prevention of gender based violence to menstrual health services and hygiene services. Um, so much of this is denied to millions of people around the world. And so we do our work largely across three areas. One is translating and amplifying data and, and insights and evidence for better policy and programs. The second one is driving our own advocacy to the U.S. government um, and to multilateral institutions and organizations at the global space to make sure that we are propelling uh, sexual reproductive health policies and investments that really meet the needs of international communities and that help women, that help young people instead of harming them. And then the third is providing flexible funding and strategic and technical support to our peer nonprofit organizations, to our peer uh, civil society organizations around the world. Um, this year, we have 96 partners uh, across 33 countries and to support them as they advance sexual and reproductive health and rights in their own countries through their own advocacy and, and their own accountability mechanisms. Um, the other thing just to lift up is that PAI receives both restricted and unrestricted funding. Uh, and that's for our own advocacy. So in this case, we are grantees, right? We receive, receive the funding. And then we also provide flexible funding, again, with the technical and strategic support to um, our peer civil society organizations, nonprofits so the, around the world, so they can, so they can also um, do their own advocacy. And we do this through our own subgranting mechanism. So that, I guess, puts us in the donor seat. Uh, so we're looking at it from, from two lenses. And, and to ask your question, to answer your question, Joanne, on local partners for PAI. For us, they're organizations that are on the front lines advocating um, for change, implementing the change while working with their local communities. Um, these are partners and organizations that represent the lived experiences of their communities and are also holding decision makers accountable so that these decision makers deliver not only on the needs of local communities and national uh, at a national level, but are also um, doing right by the commitments that um, decision makers made. 
Great. Thanks, oh. Nabiha. It's, it's interesting. I heard all three of you mention similar connotations of trust and relationship building and, and having kind of an awareness of what your local partners can bring to your mission and to your organizational goals. So I, I'm in thinking about kind of the adjectives that I heard, trust, um, uh, flexible funding, capacity, knowledge, an understanding of the uh, the policy frameworks that are uh, relevant in, in areas where you're working. If you could each speak to maybe the top kind of three issues that are most pertinent as you're thinking about local partnerships um, and partner engagement in order to make your mission the most successful. And, and I'll start with you, Lisa, obviously coming at it from a funder lens, you're, you're also thinking about how you can help your grantees be successful in this space. So we'd love to hear what you think are, are the most kind of critical issues that need to be considered when you're selecting uh, partners to work with on the ground. I mean, I think um, a lot of what matters to us comes from our framework for how we think about our philanthropy in the first place. So our trustees started the foundation really focused on how to restore human dignity in places where it was broken. When you start from that sort of frame, you have to go to, to communities to identify what that looks like, what that experience is, what's needed to rectify that. Um, and it runs the gamut, whether it is sexual reproductive health issues, whether it's um, education, livelihoods, whatever category you wanna put it in, we tend to fund across lots of different areas in which there is, there is work to be done to address this issue of sort of fundamental um, human dignity. And when we're looking to, it, it's in some ways it's less about um, you know what we're looking for and more about what we can do to be really good partners to who we fund and so while yes we are looking for local leaders and we are looking for folks who have clarity about what's happening in their community and they have um, clarity about you know how they're going to partner in their community who they're going to work with what their ecosystem is and have a theory of action around and here's what we think we need to do to make child care more available to you know improve the odds for women in this community for you know a safe existence so we follow the lead of our partners in terms of the what is it and how are they going to do it and it's a, a lot more what we spend our time on is okay so what do we do because we we write checks at some fundamental level. We're a funder, right? So, and in doing that part of our job, we are very focused. And I think this is critical above and beyond just about anything else out there. When people start to talk about how do you partner with local leaders, we provide unrestricted multi-year funding um, with minimal paperwork. Like there is, you know, we have reduced our application to four questions and that's it. And we have lots of conversations and we build trust in those conversations to then feel completely comfortable saying, yep, you've got this, here's the funding, off you go. How else can we be helpful from where we sit? Because we're also based in the United States. We're not, we're not, we don't have boots on the ground in different countries. We don't have, you know, we're not living in those communities. And so we're constantly trying to understand, okay, what else would be helpful that we can do? Um, and, and I think the other thing that that we do and that I think is really important for folks to think about is, sure, we write, we, we, we do a grant and you get a grant for multiple numbers of years, but we have access to a network of funders and others who are interested in the work that these folks are doing in different places. And so one of our key roles is connecting those folks to our partners. So we actively and sort of have set goals for ourselves around building our own peer network of funders, and then making concrete introductions and ensuring that other funders are aware of our local partners. Because oftentimes other funders will say, well, we don't, we don't know where to find people. We don't know who's working where and who's working on what. And we see that as partly our responsibility to make sure that the folks that we are supporting are known in broader funding communities, increase their opportunities for that funding. And I think the third thing that I would say that, that at least for us has been really important once we've written the check, once we're in a grant relationship, what else does an organization need and when do they need it? And we have offered, in addition to just our standard grants, we offer these flexible funds that are available for use whenever they need them for things like what we call keeping the spark alive uh, and supporting the overall health and well being of the organization and its staff. Um, oftentimes, those folks get overlooked in the process of grant making, and yet, 
you know, particularly if you're not doing unrestricted funding and organizations need resources to support those folks to not burn out, to be paid well, to get healthcare and all of those things. We also support professional development and organizational development. So the org, you know, it's an investment and we want that investment to succeed. So we, we take another step and say, what else can we do? What other resources can we bring to bear that then support you? And then I'll, the last thing I'll say that, that I think we discovered over time that in this interesting conversation that folks are having about localization or working with local leaders, how to get the money straight in the hands of these leaders. No fiscal sponsors, no US 501c3, like let's stop creating barriers to that. And so at the Imago Day Fund, we started using something called an equivalency determination as a way to sort of manage our tax requirements and keep the US, you know, okay in terms of who we're giving money to and other countries, but to make it easier for our partners to then receive money straight to their bank accounts and not have to then incur costs with fiscal sponsors or you know, delays in the funding because it has to go through all these hoops. And that is something else that I have found critically important to us being able to support effectively our local partners. It, it sounds really great, Lisa. I know on behalf of the, the hundreds of NGOs that I've worked with over time, they would hear that as, as music to their ears. And, and I'm sure it's not as easy as it sounds to implement. So we'll come back to that because I would be curious to know, you know, how, while that sounds really you know, positive and, and encouraging for those who are looking for the funding. It, it can't always be easy. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Martina, because from a from a corporate perspective, you know, a lot of the things that Lisa mentioned are going to be relevant, um, you know, particularly the relationship building that you mentioned earlier and making sure that in every place that you're working, you actually have an understanding of the complexities, you know, political or otherwise social, environmental, et cetera. How does a massive company manage that? And, and how can you leverage your partners um, at every level of your value chain to ensure that you have what you need to be effective and to deliver on your development goals when it's just so complex and massive? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the the, the real question. Um, the bureaucracy, it, it's not there just for bureaucracy's sake, but as a big corporate, we are accountable uh, to both stakeholders, but uh, or rather investors, but also a wider stakeholder group. And, you know, we have a reputation that we work hard to maintain uh, because that is our license to operate. And, and, you know, that's something that can be constraining in some respects. And um, I do think that the, there is a much um, greater appetite for embracing all manners of, of, of partnerships going forward. It, it, there is a realization that uh, we have to start working uh, with agility uh, and cutting through some of that red tape where, where necessary, whilst also still having the checks and balances. And I think that's where some of the, the partnerships that I would look at, at um, you know, bringing on board to help deploy our strategy is very much around those that are are credible that are um, have local presence and local expertise and therefore can build that trust at a local level and um, but also I guess for scale and for driving that impact in in the time frame that we have left to achieve it also opportunities to really look at strategic partnerships where we can plug and play um, a model that works and then and then leverage and bring in that local expertise where necessary so we have some very big partnerships with the likes of care and um, we've worked then with organizations such as solidaridad and technoserve on local um on a local level but always you know from again from a farming perspective because it's where the majority of my work is we would look to to um spoken wheel models where we can develop a uh, knowledge transfer between growers based on the trusted nature of, of a local leader within that community, building up those kind of um, cooperatives and communities so that they can uh, engage with us at scale, uh, whilst also having kind of their own network together. Uh, so there's no there's no easy answer, I think, to that question. And I, I absolutely um, agree that sometimes it can be frustrating, um, but actually on the flip side of that, the ability for us to, to drive impact that scale is also massive. So it's a trade-off that is worth, uh, I guess, pursuing to, to, to get the right conditions um, in, in place. And, and it might take a bit longer in the first instance. And, uh, you know, we, we work with other peers as well through the likes of um, platforms such as Side Platforms, Sustainable Agriculture Initiative, that's lots of different members. 
And again, that peer-to-peer -peer learning amongst us allows us to sort of leapfrog some of those issues sometimes as well when we get onto the ground. And um, so I think we have to pull lots of levers is probably the answer. <laughs> Understood. Yeah, it still has to be pretty complex. So like I said, we'll come back to that in a moment. But I do want to turn to you, Nabiha, if you could share, I mean, the, the challenges faced by women and girls, uh, particularly around reproductive rights and gender based violence, um, you know, more so now than ever, COVID has obviously made the challenges that PAI addresses even more pronounced. How do you how do you narrow in on the type of work that that is going to be effective for you by by relying upon your partners? What what can you kind of ask of them or, or could they ask of you in order to ensure that the investments you're making both as an implementer, but also as a as a re grantor um, can be most effective for for your kind of, you know, uh, goals that you've set as an organization. Yeah, it's, a, it's such an important question. And I think, you know, really fundamental that um, in many ways defines how you work, right? Not just the work that you're going to do and that you aspire to do, but how you go about it. And our um, engagement at PAI with our local partners is always guided by trust and, and a commitment to not only share power, but this intentionality through our multi-year commitments to shift that power um, and shift it to local organizations and, and voices. Um, and our going and assumption in any engagement is, is always one that and I've said this before, but I think it's so important. Um, I emphasize this throughout any conversation I have is one that's defined through a lens of possibility, potential and strength instead of through a lens that assumes deficiency. Um, and so when we're going in at a local level and working with partners, really two simple questions, it's what do you need and how can we help? Um, and, and I think the issue that is most pertinent to us in determining where and how we work and when to work is really um, local partners, what, what they want to commit to in terms of uh, the mission, the global mission around sexual reproductive health and rights, and also determining from their lens, them telling us if our engagement is a value add to their own aspirations. Um, we are very, very clear with not only our funded partners, so again, those who receive funding, flexible funding through our subgranting mechanism, but also um, those who fund us, both restricted and unrestricted, um, that the achievements that occur abroad, that the achievements that, are, that occur by our funded partners are their achievements. We might have contributed in some minor way, but the achievements are theirs and we always recognize them as such. Um, and so if the infusion of flexible funding and the opportunity um, to achieve your goals and um, the outcomes um, are benefited from shared learning and these additional areas of support and are viewed as urgent, then, then they, they can count on us to support, right? Um, I think that the key words for us, again, are trust, responsiveness, and flexibility. Um, and, and that's been part of our approach and, it's not just lip service. We believe in it um, wholeheartedly and authentically because we know that there has been sustained change when, when we go in with that level of flexibility and trust and also when our donors trust us um, to make the right decisions for what our own communities need. And, and, you know, again, that word trust and this idea of relationship building and relationship building fundraising is something that, you know, we believe very strongly in at Connective Impact. You, the only way you're going to really make the difference you want to make is if you do establish those personal relationships, but that can take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so, you know, this idea about flexible funding and, um, and, and kind of open resources, however you are going to, to use them at the community level led by community decisions. Lisa, I wanna ask you, what type of challenges have you found in kind of you know, doubling down on this flexible funding model and really relying upon your partners you know, at the local level and, and even kind of, as you mentioned, some of your co-funding partners, uh, what, what, how have you addressed those challenges? Or if, if not, how do you imagine they can be addressed uh, so that it's not a burden to open up this kind of flexibility, if, if you will? Organizationally, you know, foundations at least, and most sort of corporate entities or 
other well-funded or well-resourced organizations have a lot more power to decide how to use those resources, right? So we have a staff of six people at the Imago Day Fund. We're small. The question for us is, okay, so how should people be spending their time? It actually doesn't take a lot of time for us to manage the actual process of getting a grant out the door. We have streamlined our processes and systems. We've clarified what, imp what information is actually important to us, not just information to collect to collect for fun, but like, what are we actually going to use? And in that process, we've reduced the amount of time that anybody on our staff is actually spending going through paperwork and processing grants. Um, and so having done that, it frees up a, a substantial amount of time for relationship building and for staff to really spend time in conversation, in relationship with our partners on a regular basis. And we've sort of tried to set a norm we're talking to folks ongoing throughout the year to hear what's happening and to create an open, trusting environment where they can call us for good, bad, or otherwise, and not have any concerns about, well, if I tell them something bad has happened, you know, they're going to pull our funding. That's just not how we operate. And, and so I think that, that, that makes all of this flexibility functional because we are in regular communication, right? So we can be responsive when something happens. For example, most recently, obviously everybody's been doing stuff around COVID, but then in Haiti, you have on top of that an earthquake and on top of that rains. And, you know, and so we just said, okay, who in our portfolio would benefit from some additional funds to manage this moment, right? And, and there you go, and off we went. And we could do that because of sort of the ethos in which we operate around supporting our partners when they need it. Um, and, and I think, you know, the other thing that we have to do frequently, because we are so removed from the actual work on the ground, is avoid assumptions about whether something is or isn't going to work for someone. So for example, with our equivalency determination, we were like, oh, this is great. We can do direct funding. And isn't that awesome? And everybody's going to want it that way. And it's like, mm, actually, no. Um, there are other benefits for folks using fiscal sponsors. There are other mechanisms by which people have organized to receive their funding. And so we didn't make it a policy that we have to do it that way. Instead, what we've done is say, here, here's the menu of things that we have the capacity to offer, which one works best for you? And that's true for whether it's like how the funding and the, gets to you, it's true for you know, what grant cycle you wanna be on. You know, we've tried to really let our partners tell us what's gonna be most useful for them to do the work that we want to support and then do the best we can to meet them where they are on those things. And then I'll, I'll turn that similar question to you, Martina. Again, kind of the, the complexities where you come from and at the global level, where are the biggest challenges? And, and you know, the word burden has come up um, in conversations that I've, I've had with, with you know, community-led organizations that don't want to feel like a burden. They, they want it to feel easy. Um, so how does a large corporate entity make it so that it's relatively straightforward to work in multiple places at the local level? And what challenges do you face that can be overcome? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, uh, I don't have a really good answer to that. I, I think that, um, you know, we've said about this meaningful engagement, and I think I often refer back to the UN Human Rights Due Diligence Framework and apply it actually to any of the programs that we do. I think it, doesn't, it isn't a particular to human rights, um, but actually how, how you engage with those local partners, how you engage with all tiers across and, and have an acknowledgement and, and I think bring some candor to that, that we don't all have the right answers and, and we acknowledge that everything can't be perfect. There is a tendency, I would say, within a corporate to worry and be concerned about putting the head above the parapet and wanting everything to be great before we talk about it. Um, but actually, a lot of the, the, the doing is in the learning and, and in the implementation. Uh, and I do think that what, what we'll find going forward of, over the course of you know, this next decade, I suppose, which is a shift change for, for Diageo, but also for, for many corporates really in our approach um, is, is, like I say, bringing that agility, bringing that local voice. We have a very strong um, uh, commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, as a business, uh, both within our own business, but also throughout our supply chain. And I think the idea and the concept of that is really about bringing that diversity of thought and, and, and what the other panelists have suggested around 
listening to those that, that know, bringing their insights into the conversation so that we can be much more effective. Um, it, it does feel sometimes that as a corporate, um, there you know, is a level of compliance that takes a lot of time. That means you don't um, focus on the things that need to be focused on. That's just the nature of our business. I don't think we're going to avoid it. Um, but I do think that, that we are looking at opportunities to how to move beyond compliance. And if I just think about one that we're working on, on a project with a number of different partners um, through ISEAL, um, and that's really looking at, at uh, agricultural standards that we would require a level of compliance against and saying, oh, actually, we, we, we create a lot of uh, burden and, and uh, work for people on farm implementing standards. There's a lot of costs that can become an exclusive barrier to participation. And that's certainly not so, something that we want to, to encourage. And um, so what are the real key practices out of that set of 110 that drive the impact that we want? So really trying to pivot and particularly, I suppose, the work that I've been doing on regenerative agriculture in particular is moving much more towards outcome focused rather than practice led and um, really nuanced at a local level, recognizing that conditions change and that you cannot apply one size fits all. We're not there yet. It's very much, I think, as an industry, a work in progress around how do you measure those outcomes effectively, but really start focusing in uh, the effort on, on those that, that that will achieve the biggest uh, kind of impact. Um, but I'm excited to see where that goes. I think uh, that there's a lot of opportunity in, in making that shift and, uh, and actually an awful lot of urgency that I think uh, businesses and corporates generally appreciate now. And, and that's been driven both from a consumer level and the customer, but also from a, from the investor community, um, and I think that that's what's great about this panel today. There's there's multiple stakeholders that see all angles of that, and actually, we all want the, the same thing ultimately. And and trying to get to shared value is, is is the key. I really appreciate the optimism. You know that that can only help given the the dynamics that we've been facing the last couple of years. And I know Nabiha, you're actually in New York, um, in live and in person in Concordia, the lucky duck. Uh, and I and there's obviously a lot of policy discussions happening this week. You know around what do we do with this planet of ours given given what we've been facing lately. I'm curious. You know from your perspective, you know are the policy challenges that an organization like PAI faces um, enough to overcome so that you feel like you can really double down on, on the work itself? Uh, are, the, are there other challenges that, that you come in contact with that you think, you know, some days, oh gosh, are we going to really be able to, to do our work that we've set out for? Maybe you could talk to, to kind of how you manage that as the head of, of PAI. Yeah, um, and, and it's constant, right? There, there are external dynamics changing the landscape, uh, a, a lot of threats to not only women's health and, and sexual reproductive health, but to the overall well-being of families and communities around the world. COVID threw all of us for a loop, right? So um, there's so much. And then, and then you also recognize um, that there are needs and expectations that need to be met um, for also our donors and our supporters. And so it's always it's always an important balance. And I think the biggest thing, again, being an advocacy organization is where we win big, actually in two areas is, is when we have the flexibility from our donors um, to do the urgent, nimble, flexible work, the agile work that we have to do to advocate and make sure that policies are not harmful and regressive, right? Um, to make sure also that we can quickly pivot and subgrant out to funded partners in communities abroad um, that need to preserve and protect their own bodies of work to ensure that we're not eroding the fabric of health services and services to community in the face of a pandemic. So maybe initially they planned on doing X set of activities, but given the pandemic, they've got to pivot to keep the doors open and meet the other urgent needs of families in, in those communities. So that is the beauty, you know, that is the beauty of, of having flexible, unrestricted funding is we can be um, very responsive um, and, and much more impactful. And, and I think just in terms of how do you align all of this, I think the alignment around the longer term aspirations and the shorter term goals is always at the forefront. 
Um, the reality is that there's always a quote unquote return on investment conversation, right? That certainly is um, a conversation that happens in, in the corporate ranks, but you know, it's something in di using different words that occurs for all organizations is what is expected through this investment. Um, and that sometimes, as I said, is explicit or it's implied when funding is on the table. And I do make always a strong case as an advocacy organization that when you are flexible with your funding to us, we can be even more flexible to the funding to our partners with unrestricted and so on and so forth. But I also always say that we have to honor and respect the wishes of our major donors who also have a point of view, who also have their own expectations. And I think there's this need to have openness from both sides, right? From donors and grantees um, like PAI to say one, these are our values. This is our mission. These are our ways of working. Are we aligned, right? Are, are you in alignment with our, with our reason for being? And two, what outcomes are essential from both, both perspectives or multiple perspectives? And are we aligned there or can we have an open conversation and maybe we're meeting somewhere in the middle. So I always say it should not be a zero sum game. Um, it should not be a zero sum game with anything. Certainly with policy, there's a sense of we need action now. And we realize that advocacy is a constant, right? The accountability is a constant. So our work grows and grows and grows um, to get the impact that we want to achieve. And, and we need to lift each other up and ensure that as we, as we do this together, we're not being extractive of resources, that we're not being extractive in our approach as we work with our funded partners and our peer civil society organizations. And, and at the end of the day, that, that we're all deploying our strengths and our good intentions and our assets in, in ways that are grounded in that transparency and that trust and the co-creation of priorities. Um, and, and if I could say one last, last thing, and this is perhaps more internal and the dynamic with, um, with donors and, and partners and grantees is also looking at the requirements as a donor. Um, Lisa's noted how, um, how her organization is simplified, but the reporting requirements, the engagement requirements, the expectations that are in place for grantees, some of it might be perfectly acceptable for a PAI that might have that infrastructure to do that. But it can be a tremendous burden for smaller CSOs who need to be focused more on externally and, and driving that mission than on getting us reports. And, and from our perspective, we, we want to reduce that burden. Um, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we want to be extraordinary, extraordinary stewards of every single dollar that we get. Um, and PA is very fortunate to, to receive the support that we have. We'll always be very transparent, but I think it's important. Um, that we just determine and be really clear what is absolutely essential to have um, and what is a nice to do, but, but may, not be, may not be essential. Well, I'm going to ask the audience, for those of you attending live, if you do have questions, feel free to add them into the Q&A section. Um, we should be able to maybe ask one or two. I did want to put one question out to anyone who wants to take it, and that is, is there a group... Um, of, of partner types that you haven't worked with, uh, be they local or global, that you find yourself kind of intrigued by. So, you know, for example, we're finding that the impact investor space is becoming a very popular uh, attraction for NGOs that want to test out new innovative approaches to some of their work and even for corporates. Um, so I guess the question is to anyone who wants to take it, are there, are there different groups that you haven't worked with that you would like to try working with in the future? I, I was just having this conversation over dinner last night, and I think one space, and, and again, in, in the space of being part of global movements, um, is the opportunity to, to work more deeply with um, groups that are, are looking at uh, promoting global change and, and local change through really innovative digital um, platforms and digital mechanisms. It's how can we rally and share information and share best practices. And I think especially now in this time of COVID where there might be some resistance to come together in person and that in and of itself can be a burden is we've got amazing tech tools. How do we deploy them for case making and for achieving the aspirations of our cause? That, that's top of mind. 
Martina or Lisa, either of you want to answer that? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd actually endorse um, that that technology space really is is has the power to really unlock an awful lot of value. Um, I, I'm acutely aware of the potential for for you know we're already it's already happening that the growing disparity uh, of of wealth and and of those with the have and and the have not and I think COVID has really amplified that. Um, you know, there are still many parts of the global south where children aren't returned to school yet because lockdowns are happening. And, and then there's other parts of the world where the concern is, well, do they have a, an iPad? You know, it, it's the, that, that access to education actually as a gap is something that, that is only going to continue. And I think there's huge amounts of opportunity with technology so that, that, so to utilize that technology so it doesn't reinforce that gap. And um, I think if we only make a, a technology available to those that already can afford it, then then we potentially just do more harm than good by reinforcing the 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 the, uh, the widening gap there. So I think opportunities to really, and I think uh, it's good to see technology companies coming on board with that as a mission. Uh, in terms, of, and I've seen it. We certainly are engaging with certain technology companies who are looking to, um, I suppose, have have their own ESG approach that that is partly philanthropic, I would say today, they're still trying to work out the commercial models of some of that, but I think there's massive amounts of opportunity to be explored there. Um, and I think it is it's something that we'll see more and more of as well. Well, and I, we've got just a couple of minutes. So um, what I'd love to do is, is just open it up to each of you kind of to, to give a final reflection on uh, the topic of, of local partners, diversified partners, this idea of flexible funding, flexible resources at the local community level, and how we can really amplify that work to improve our development scenario. Um, so we'll go in reverse order this time. Let's start with Nabiha. Let's, what's kind of your, your final word for today as we get ready to close? Thanks, Joanne. You know, I, I think, again, just to reinforce that we need to approach partnerships from a perspective of, of possibility and potential and strength um, and, and recognizing that um, there is this need to co-create and, and collaborate and, and realizing that movement making is not about the preservation of one institution. You know, I always say this, that PAI does not have offices, bricks and mortar around the world, we are in the movement to bring as many people in and, and sit around the table together and be on this journey um, together. And so we need a lot of voices, we need a lot of ideas, and we need sustained support to achieve those gains for, for women, for young people, for communities around the world. Um, so, so let's approach it with, with a big tent and um, a colorful brush of possibility. Um, that's what movements are made of. I hope they, they heard that loud and clear throughout the city of New York this week. Martina, what's your final word? Well, I love the descriptor of, of colorful brush of possibility. Anyway, I think that's a brilliant uh, visual uh, image that I'm gonna take away from today's discussion. So thanks, uh, Naviha, for that. Um, for me, I think, you know, uh, really historically philanthropy and has been sort of that idea of pushing down, I think really hearing from the bottom up um, and, and you know, shaping solutions as opposed to in, imposing them um, is really what will unlock the greatest value. And, you know, from simple thing, simple, I say simple, uh, simple premises, actually, that's probably appropriate to say, of, of a living wage that will enable um, people to, to put their own resources into, into what makes the most sense for them and their communities, I think is, is a something that as a corporate, uh, is increasingly becoming a priority. Um, and I think the power that that will unlock is, is, is going to be significant as well as we see that cascade and, and that, that sort of amplify over time. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to, to seeing what that brings in terms of, uh, of the scope that, of change that can come uh, from those local communities and through those local partnerships. We'll be watching Martina as Diageo leads on that. Lisa, final words. I too really appreciate the colorful brush, Nabiha. Thank you. Uh, we're all going to borrow that, and, and we'll give you credit um, for it. Um, you know, I, I was on a panel yesterday for um, a different organization, and as we were talking about trust and partnership and 
um, participation in a broader sense of how do, how do we engage partners in the work we're trying to do, it dawned on me that we were leaving out a really key part of this conversation, which is about understanding mutuality and understanding that if in fact, we all want to solve some of the problems that we see out in the world, we actually have to believe deeply that at every part of a problem, engagement is absolutely critical and that it doesn't have to be led to, to a point I think Martina was making earlier, it doesn't have to be led by those with the resources per se, right? And, and that, you know, to truly solve some of these problems, we not just have to talk about, well, how do I partner with you? It's, it's how do we redistribute power so that the work you're doing can happen with or without me? You know, I, I just think that sometimes we end up in these weird conversations about us and them, local and national, you know, you know, INGOs versus CBOs. And, it, and it, we need to figure out how to break through some of that paradigm in order to live into what I'm hearing to be in Martina talk about locally in community with others in ways that I just don't know if we have the imagination yet to do. And I, I'm, I'm hopeful that these kinds of conversations can spur us in that direction and um, yeah, and take us to the next step when it comes to really partnering across all of the different parts of a problem ecosystem or challenge. That's a great way to, to end this, Lisa. That's a challenge for us over the next year. Let's let's meet back here in a year and see how far we can we can get among among this group. I love um, it. <laughs> but I want to thank the three of you, Martina, Lisa, and Abija, for being here with me today and having this important conversation. I want to thank Concordia for hosting us. And I really look forward to working with all of you as we advance this important issue. And I wish you all a great rest of your day and week. And Abija, enjoy New York. Thanks again. Thanks so Thank much. You. For Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Nice to meet everyone.